Good afternoon. I'm here today with Alberta's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Hinshaw, to provide an update on the COVID-19 closely, and there are frustrations when we have this kind of technical issue. We have a team of dedicated professionals who work hard on that data, not just the daily case numbers, but also the extensive dashboard application that has aggregate data, chart, graphs on vaccines, severe outcomes, characteristics of this virus, and more. Alberta reports some of the best information of any jurisdiction in the country. But the pandemic is straining every part of our response, including our reporting system. We'll continue to work to limit delays and resolve issues with reporting as they arise. But we have data, so let's review it. Currently, the number of lab-confirmed active cases sits at 51,157. Of course, we know that due to the current eligibility for PCR testing and expanded availability of rapid tests, the actual number is much higher. What is less likely to be impacted by the testing criteria is our positivity rate, which is currently at 43%. This is still high, but our average positivity has not risen since January the 6th. We are also monitoring the level of COVID virus in wastewater across the province. In most of the centers we're monitoring, COVID-19 levels in our wastewater are starting to drop. In some cases, such as in Edmonton, COVID-19 levels in the wastewater there have been dropping for nearly two weeks. Taken together, these are early positive signs that transmission and new cases may be slowing. However, even though there are early indications are coming down, our hospitalizations are continuing to increase. Today, there are 1,377 people in hospital who have tested positive for COVID-19 which is an increase of about 30% over the past week. As in previous waves, hospital emissions will lag behind cases. So there's no discrepancy in the fact that cases seem to be start to be going down while emissions at the same time are rising. It means, I hope, we're at a turning point in the current wave and we can start to see the end of it. But make no mistake, the coming weeks are going to be the toughest yet for many Albertans and for the people working in core inpatient units in our hospitals. But admissions follow cases. Once we see a sustained drop in cases, we can expect to be on the downslope in admissions within a few weeks. Now, over the last seven days, an average of 58.6% of new non-ICU admissions and 66.1% of new ICU admissions are directly due to COVID-19. The remainder are patients with COVID-19, where COVID is an incidental infection unrelated to the admission, or it's unclear whether or not it's related. But as we said before, whether patients are in hospital to be treated for COVID or they just happen to be infected, we need to make sure that these patients don't go on to affect other patients or staff. Our hospitals have additional care protocols in place to prevent further transmissions. Those practices take time and resources and add to the strain on our system. That's why, as we announced last week, our government and AHS have activated contingency plans to prepare for the additional burden that Omicron continues to place on our acute care system. These contingency plans include maximizing capacity with pandemic response units, adjusting staffing, and establishing community COVID clinics where appropriate. Our hospitals are under strain, especially in the larger urban centers. Staff are tired, not just from the current wave of cases, but from five waves over two years. We owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. But I also want to be clear that the health system is there for you if you need it, and it is safe. AHS is still doing around 90% of normal surgery volume. Now, they may have to reduce more, 
but they'll do it in the most limited way they can and work hard to avoid the kind of reductions that we've seen in previous waves. They have plans in place to manage the patients in hospital today and over the coming weeks. In fact, as of today, we're still within the normal capacity of the non-ICU <coughs> units that take the vast majority of COVID patients that we're seeing with Omicron. That's for the system overall. There are certainly some sites that are already over 100% capacity where surge spaces are in use and more will be used as necessary in the coming days. The system is under strain, that's no question, but we can manage it thanks to the dedication of our people. And again, I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to all healthcare workers, doctors, and volunteers who are providing the critical care needed by Albertans. I'm also pleased to announce today that the first shipments of Paxlovid, Pfizer's at-home prescription COVID-19 treatment are set to be available to Albertans starting January 31st. Initially, 3,200 courses of treatment will be available as another option in addition to the antibody therapy we've been using for the past several months to help keep eligible individuals with mild to moderate COVID from experiencing severe illness and ending up in hospital. Paxlovid will be a second option for some individuals and Sotrabimab remains available for Albertans who may benefit from treatment. I know there have been many questions about this treatment since it was approved by Health Canada last Monday and people are curious to know how it can be assessed. Our staff has been working through implementation details in developing guidance for clinicians and pharmacists. The short answer is it can and will be accessible for Albertans soon. The longer answer is that because there is a limited supply and because it is a medication that causes some side effects, only specific groups of Albertans will be eligible to get it. There's a process in place to make sure those who need it the most will be first in line. Paxlovid is a pill taken orally that is available only with a prescription. Treatment has to start within the first five days of COVID-19 symptoms. It is intended for use by individuals 18 and older who have specific medical conditions or those who are unvaccinated and 65 years of age and older. Dr. Hinshaw will have more details on these conditions in a few moments. In addition, to be eligible for Paxlovid, a patient must have a PCR-confirmed COVID-19 infection. Due to such a limited initial supply, the drug will only be available at select number of pharmacies in the province by, by prescription and after an assessment by AHS HealthLink. Albertans are asked not to call pharmacies or physician offices directly. We hope that this will change as supply increases, but any expansion will be subject to the federal government providing additional doses. The use of therapeutic Therapeutic drugs is a promising next step in our efforts to fight more serious outcomes, such as hospitalization due to COVID-19. However, we cannot rely solely on it and the ones that will inevitably follow to get us through this wave or any future wave, which is why we continue to make vaccines easily and conveniently available across the entire province. On that note, I am pleased to say that Alberta has received an additional supply of Pfizer, approximately 500,000 doses this month. While we know that both mRNA vaccines are safe and effective, I know that some Albertans have been waiting for Pfizer as they prefer to receive the same vaccine for all three doses. So if you've been waiting, it's here, and please book your appointment today. You can book an appointment online through the Alberta Vaccine Booking System or by directly contacting your local pharmacy. And if you live on a reserve, you can also contact your local public health clinic. Many pharmacies have doses available on a walk-in basis, so you can also try just showing up if you prefer. This is true for all doses, not just boosters. So if you're not yet fully vaccinated, you can get your first or second dose today through most pharmacies in Alberta. Getting fully vaccinated against COVID-19 is our best defense against this virus and our best way to help keep our health system from being overwhelmed. 
In addition to getting fully vaccinated, I'd like to encourage Alberta to continue to follow health guidelines in place, wear a mask when appropriate, and stay home if you're not feeling well, as I recently did. Omicron is so pre prevalent in Alberta right now that even mild symptoms like a runny nose and slight cough could well be COVID. Because we never know just how far a chain of transmission might reach, it's better to be safe than sore. So thank you for doing your part to protect yourself and reduce the strain on their healthcare system. And thanks again to all our, our healthcare professionals who are working so hard and will be continue to work to provide the healthcare service for Albertans through the coming next very challenging weeks. I'll now invite Dr. Hinshaw to the podium to say a few words. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to build on the Minister's remarks about our data issues yesterday by saying I know that we have all come to rely on the daily updates, especially the ones on Mondays that tell us the weekend numbers, so it's frustrating for everyone to have technical difficulties get in the way of that. What may not be immediately apparent is the complexity of the system required to get the updates completed every weekday and the many people who work hard behind the scenes to make that happen. The numbers we post online rely on 10 different data systems with millions of different data points cross-referenced and quality checked every day. The infrastructure necessary for this to go smoothly has been built and enhanced over time. But just like any other system, Sometimes one of the components has a technical issue. That has a ripple effect throughout the whole system. Our teams worked hard all day yesterday to address the technical problems that cropped up, but unfortunately weren't able to get all systems back up and running until today. The dashboards will be updated today with the usual content, and I want to thank Albertans for their patience as we continually strive to make a wide variety of data points available in as timely a way as possible. I also want to say how much I appreciate our amazing analytics and IT teams and how hard they have worked over the past two years to ensure that we are able to provide robust and timely data to the public. Speaking of data, over the ca past couple of weeks we have had to modify our reporting, which has included schools. Today I have an update provided by Alberta Education. As of January 24th, 18 of the more than 2,500 schools in Alberta have shifted to temporary at-home learning to address operational challenges. Five of the 18 have less than 40 students total. This means that less than 1% of schools are on temporary at-home learning. All requests from schools to shift to at-home learning have been approved. Alberta Education will continue to work with school authorities on shifts to at-home learning. School authorities continue to have the flexibility to shift a class or an individual grade to short-term at-home learning to address operational challenges at school if needed. Turning to today's numbers, over the last 24 hours we have identified 2,722 new cases of COVID-19 and completed about 6,700 tests. The positivity rate is about 42.8%. Sadly, 13 new deaths have been reported to Alberta Health over the past 24 hours. Again, I ask all of us to remember that each of these numbers and each number in hospital or ICU reporting is a person. COVID continues to have a significant impact and I extend my sympathies to anyone who has lost a loved one to COVID or any other cause in the recent weeks. As the Minister has announced, there is now a new option to treat COVID-19 after someone has been infected. In addition to the monoclonal antibody we have been able to offer to Albertans for several months, last week Health Canada approved Paxlovid, a drug that can treat mild to moderate cases of COVID-19. As you heard, starting Monday, January 31st, we will be able to offer it to a limited group of Albertans. We have established the current eligibility criteria to ensure that those who are most at risk and who have no contraindications are able to access this treatment in a timely manner, helping to reduce the risk of COVID progressing to a more serious stage. The criteria include immunocompromised individuals age 18 and over, regardless of their vaccination status, who have received transplants, who are cancer patients and have received chemotherapy or another immunosuppressive treatment in the past two years, 
or who have an inflammatory condition that they are being treated for, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, or inflammatory bowel disease. Paxlovid will also be a possible option for Albertans who are unvaccinated and over the age of 65, or age 18 or older with a pre-existing health condition, such as diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease or obstructive pulmonary disease, or congestive heart failure. In addition to meeting one of the criteria I have just mentioned, individuals must have a confirmed case of COVID and be within five days of when they first experienced COVID-19 symptoms. Individuals who meet these criteria will be prompted to contact HealthLink when they receive their positive results for an initial evaluation of eligibility. Those who are potentially eligible will then be referred to a clinician with training and options for early COVID treatment, both monoclonal antibodies and Paxlovid. As Paxlovid medication can cause side effects, it will be available only by prescription after an assessment by these clinicians who can determine which of the treatment options would be recommended for the patient. I know that there may be many Albertans who wish to access Paxlovid or Sotrovimab, the other currently approved COVID-19 treatment, but supplies are limited at this time. These treatments have marginal benefit for individuals at low risk of hospitalization, and there are also risks of inducing antiviral resistance to COVID-19 if Paxlovid is used improperly. This is why we are starting the use of this medication with a centralized system to ensure that the benefits of its use outweigh the risks. As we learn more, we will be able to evaluate the data and update eligibility criteria as appropriate. In the future, we will also be transitioning to a broader community prescription approach, but this will take time. For now, please do not call pharmacies or physicians directly to get a prescription for Paxlovid, as they will be unable to give it to you. And as the saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. While Paxlovid is a new secondary option to prevent mild or moderate cases of COVID-19 from progressing to severe disease, it bears repeating that it is not a substitute for vaccination. Vaccination is the most effective way to prevent severe cases of COVID-19 and reduce the risks that come with getting infected. Unfortunately, we cannot yet perfectly predict if any individual will have COVID-19 and have only a week-long experience with mild symptoms, or if there's long COVID or severe symptoms that result. What we do know is that vaccines can protect us from the worst impacts of COVID-19. We also know that COVID-19 vaccines that we get as individuals can reach beyond us to help protect those who cannot be vaccinated themselves. A recent analysis of our data shows that adult vaccination affects the chances of very young children getting infected with COVID-19. Children in households where no adults have been vaccinated have a one and a half times greater chance of being hospitalized with COVID-19 compared to children in households where all adults are fully vaccinated. This data supports the fact that vaccination remains the best way to prevent severe outcomes such as hospitalization due to COVID-19, not only for ourselves, but also for our households. This is why, like the Minister, I continue to encourage Albertans to get every vaccine dose that they are eligible for. Some may wonder if they have had COVID recently, whether they should still get their booster dose now. I think it is reasonable for those who have had a recent confirmed case of COVID-19 to wait a few months before getting a booster, although all available data indicates there is no significant risk of harm in receiving a vaccine once recovered from a COVID infection. For those who have just felt ill and have not been tested to know if they have COVID or not, I would recommend getting a booster once you have recovered, as there are other viruses circulating that may have been the cause of the illness. Third doses help not just the person receiving it, but those around you as well, as doses limit the chance of getting COVID and spreading the infection to others. Today, I also want to comment on a remark I made last week about hospitalizations in five to 11 year olds who had a single dose of vaccine. I have gone back to our data to ensure that I have the most recent information on this. And I can tell you that we have had six hospitalizations in those in this age group who have had one dose. This is compared with 75 hospitalizations in the last 120 days 
in those who have had no doses in this age group. Many children in this age group are coming due for their second doses now, and I encourage parents to access this protection for their children and their families. In addition, I would like to remind Albertans that we always have a choice to do the right thing for ourselves and for others. I know that as we see numbers rise and fall, it is easy to become desensitized, and that as we have vaccines and new treatments available, it may seem like we no longer need to rely on measures that have helped us get to this point. But it is important that we continue to protect ourselves and others by using all the tools at our disposal. Whether it's masking whenever we're indoors in a public place, distancing from others when possible, or reducing our social contacts by at least half. If we continue to use all of these measures in tandem, along with vaccines, we will be able to reduce transmission and reduce the impacts and the strain on our health care providers. Thank you, and we're happy to take questions. Thank you, Minister Copping, and thank you, Dr. Hinshaw, for your comments. Now I'd like to open the floor to questions from media. We have a few minutes for that. So, Operator, would you please let the first caller through? Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Dr. Hinshaw, I want to ask you about um, masking in the schools. There's a new report out by uh, an American group of physicians and scientists uh, called Urgency of Normal. It's a group of people who want, or are pushing for um, the lives of our kids to return to normal. And they're questioning the efficacy and the use of masking policies in schools, um, saying that these studies don't show any defined benefit for them. The, the latest studies don't show that, and that it's time to get rid of them. On what science would you say our masking policy is based on in Alberta? In Alberta, we have looked at the available evidence with respect to the impacts of masking in community and uh, again looking at settings where there have been a, a small number of community randomized controlled trials done that looked at the impact of medical masks in particular. Uh, and those are the, the medical grade surgical type masks that showed reductions in infection rates. Uh, we've also looked at our own data with respect to um, in the fall where we had masking in uh, some schools and not in others, we did observe uh, differences in outbreaks in schools where masking was not in use as opposed to schools that uh, was in use. So we have that observational data available from our own experience in the fall. I would say that all of us are very keen to get back to more of a normal situation for ourselves and our children. But we also know that COVID-19 is still a threat, that transmission is still high, and that while children, and especially kids in the uh, younger age group, that 5 to 11 group, are at individual lower risk of severe outcomes, that risk is not zero. And those kids can also take uh, COVID-19 if they get infected home to their families. So unfortunately, uh, we must continue to use the interventions that we know have an impact and get through this current wave before we can consider how we can cautiously make decisions that uh, help us get back to more of a normal approach while at the same time not putting people's health at jeopardy with direct COVID impacts. Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. David, do you have a follow-up? Yes, Dr. Hinshaw, in the past you talked about children having a risk from COVID, which is, I, I think, and I, I don't think I'm putting words in your mouth, similar to the flu. Um, is that changed with Omicron? Is the risk, has, have we seen a greater risk for children um, than in the past? The risk of severe outcomes does vary a little bit by the specific variant. So we know that with Omicron, the individual risk seems to be lower than the risk from Delta. Having said that, when the transmission of any variant is extremely high, uh, we can see increased numbers of kids needing hospital care. The thing that is significantly different between influenza and COVID is the risk that it poses for older people and the fact that children can unfortunately introduce the virus back to households or those who they're around um, and we need to consider the interventions for the benefit of our entire communities. So with respect to, to influenza, again, um, 
in the case of Omicron, again, that individual risk uh, is quite low. But we've also, in the past, when we have influenza circulating, we have other um, protections in place that don't cause that same kind of significant severe illness burden. And those are the differences that we're needing to navigate right now. Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. Operator, can you let our next caller through? Rick Bell, Calgary Sun. Uh, good afternoon, Minister and uh, Dr. Hinshaw. Question for Minister Copping, and I will have a follow-up. Uh, the main question is, um, you've uh, spoken some pretty hopeful language, uh, Minister Copping, about what the future will look like, and I'm not going to ask you for an actual date or even something close to an actual date of when there could be a serious uh, lifting of restrictions because, of course, you can't provide that date. I understand that. There are a lot of people, including even people who are your colleagues on the United Conservative benches who would like to see some of the major restri restrictions or major measures such as vaccine passports or masks, et cetera, uh, to eventually be gone. So let's look at those more major um, measures like vaccine passports and masks. Can you give us some sense? I know the hospital numbers have to go down. I, I've heard all that before, but basically some sense of some place on the calendar where at least we can look at where that will or will not happen, or will happen, I should say. Well, thanks for the, the, the question, Rick. And, and you were right in, as you started out your question. I can't give you a date because uh, we don't know what's going to happen. I, I am hopeful uh, that the number of cases uh, are on, on the downslope. Um, but as, as we said today, hospitalizations are continuing to rise. Um, all going well, we'll see those, you know, in, in the next few weeks. They'll start to come down, and, and I think the premier said this before. You know, uh, you know, we can start looking at uh, reducing restrictions uh, once we see a sustained trend and a reduction in cases and a reduction in, in, in hospitalizations. I, I fully appreciate uh, that uh, that people are tired. Uh, we went from the fourth wave, um, very modest uh, changes to uh, restrictions, uh, and then we had to increase them for the uh, for uh, to manage through the fifth wave. Uh, now, again, I'm I'm hopeful that. Uh, uh, where uh, the cases are cresting and and uh, and coming down the other side, and we'll and we'll see in a couple of weeks uh, that in our in our in our hospitals. But right now, we need to continue to focus on you know following the uh, the, the the restrictions, uh, you know, staying home when you're sick, wearing masks, getting booster shots to get through this. See the hospital numbers come down, uh, and then we can take the the the, the next step. Follow up, Rick. Yes, and it's kind of a, a quickie two-part follow-up because I just want a clarification on the first one and then the follow-up. The clarification is you talk about you want to see a sustained trend of hospitalizations going down. Are we talking about it could take three months, two months, six months, five? I mean, just a ballpark of when you are hoping, just hoping that a sustained trend is there. And today, Premier Legault said about his province that a lot of people in his province are fed up. They're fed up with the restrictions. It's been 22 months. That's Premier Legault. What have you heard from people here, and what do you think the prevailing mood is of Albertans with respect to restrictions? So if you could answer, when do you think that sustained trend in hospitalizations is going to go down? And do you, what do you see as the prevailing mood of Albertans? Legault says in Quebec, a lot of people are fed up. What is the prevailing mood here? Yeah, so I, I appreciate, you know, I'm hearing from people that it's been incredibly challenging, especially from fourth wave straight into the uh, in, into the fifth wave, uh, and, and people are tired. Um, we're, we're still in the middle of the fifth wave right now, but there, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, in terms of uh, timelines, very difficult to give give that to you, Rick. Um, we can look at other jurisdictions around the world and see that the you know numbers have come down, and some of them quite quickly. Uh, but again, uh, we'll be watching uh, other jurisdictions here in Canada as well, uh, very closely. You know, Ontario, Quebec, who are, are a little bit ahead of us, uh, what they're doing, uh, and then you know gauge ourselves accordingly. Thank you, Minister Copping. Operator, can you let through the next caller? Thank you, Lisa McGregor, Global Edmonton. Hi there. There is a huge discrepancy in the amount of rapid tests given out 
to each province, so much so that when you do the math, essentially it's four in Alberta per person. You got 13 per person in Saskatchewan and even 10 per person in Nova Scotia. And you even have people in Saskatchewan mailing rapid tests to people in Alberta because they're so desperate for the test. And the Fed confirmed that before January, this was on the government of each province to decide how much they'd get and when. So my question to you is, how do you explain the management of that, especially because now it's costing Albertans more money out of pocket because they're so desperate for a test? We ramped up our, we, we've had a testing, a rapid testing program for, uh, for employers uh, and for uh, organizations um, to be able to test uh, employees in, in, in critical settings. And that program has been running uh, all the way, like th number of months last year. We opened up a public uh, program in December of, of last year, uh, started uh, putting out more and more tests. Uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the federal government, as of January, given the increased demands, uh, even though we had backdated orders from December, um, they base, the, the federal government at that point had said, given the demand across the country, uh, indicated to us that they were going to give it out on a per population basis uh, and be able to provide the tests uh, for us. So, you know, given, given concerns of that and, and the availability of tests, uh, as you know, uh, we as a, as a government uh, in, uh, went forward to uh, buy an additional 10 million tests uh, ourselves uh, and, and get them out. So, and, and, but there has been a challenge in some of the supply chains. Uh, over, uh, oh, we saw this over January. Some of the uh, the shipments were delayed, uh, but we are getting those uh, those out now. But if, if you want to explain the difference between, you know, some of the the, the tests, uh, Saskatchewan ran a a, uh, a public system uh, and, and uh, with public access to tests uh, earlier on uh, than we did. That, that may explain some of it. At this point in time, I know that the federal government is distributing it on a per capita basis, and and our government is also going out to uh, purchase tests to get them in the hands of Albertans as quickly as possible. And Lisa, do you have a follow-up? I do. I think I just need clarification. I mean, yes, now moving forward it's per capita, but I'm talking beforehand. Can you sit here and say that maybe the government of Alberta wasn't late to the party or perhaps underestimated how much Albertans wanted these free tests? Because, I mean, regardless of programs, you've got a population in Alberta that's very different than Saskatchewan. People in Saskatchewan can still walk into a clinic today and get a free test, no problem. So is there any responsibility in the fact that prior to January, our government didn't jump on board to get those tests? And now people are having to pay 30 bucks, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, because they want to live their lives and they, they needed a rapid test. Yeah, so we, we did uh, have rapid tests coming in for a, uh, for a program. Uh, for employers and, and so that we can actually test in, in, in a number of settings. Uh, and then we actually started our public program in, uh, uh, in December, um, asked for additional uh, tests from the federal government. Um, we didn't receive all of those, and then because of the concerns of that, we went out and, uh, and we, we purchased uh, over 10 million tests ourselves to be able to get out to Albertans. Uh, again, as I said, there was challenges in, re in regards to uh, supply chains uh, as a result. Um, some of those didn't come out as early in January, uh, but we have far more tests that are, are coming out, will be coming out towards the end of this month. Thank you, Minister Copping. Operator, can you through the next question? Thank you, Matt Woodman, CTV. Hi there, my question is for Minister Copping. Um, we heard that a patient died while waiting for care at the emergency room at the Red Deer Hospital this weekend. Uh, apparently they were assessed and it was determined their situation wasn't severe enough for urgent care. What is your message to this family uh, who was told this and their loved one died? Yeah, so my, my heart goes out uh, to the family uh, and anyone who's, who's passed away in, in, our, in our system. Uh, I don't have all the details on this. I've just, I just heard about it. I know that uh, AHS is investigating. I understand that some of the facts that, that, that you have raised, that they were triaged and, and, uh, and brought into the, uh, into the emergency department and then and sadly passed away. So I'm I, uh, you know, taking this matter very seriously. Uh, and I've asked AHS for a report, and they're looking into it at this point in time. Thank you. And do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, healthcare workers tell us this is a sign that uh, staff are overwhelmed and the system is stressed. So what can be done to stop this from happening again to another Alberta family? 
Yeah, I, I understand that there is strain on the system. I can, my, my, my understanding in terms of initial reports that, you know, the emergency department uh, in Red Deer at that time was, was, uh, was fully staffed, uh, recognized that there are, long, there are some long wait times so that that person was uh, admitted. Um, but, but again, you know, our focus, and, and this is part of the plan that we laid out last week, uh, is to, you know, uh, provide uh, additional surge capacity to deal with, with COVID, which is putting strain on the system. Uh, as indicated, we'll be opening up some uh, PR, PRUs uh, this week. Uh, and then, you know, leveraging is, uh, the staff as much as, uh, as much as possible. You know, as Dr. Yu indicated last week, uh, we're bringing on board numbers of nursing students. We, we've hired uh, over the last two years, hundreds of nurses into the system. Uh, we recognize this is going to be a challenging time, but we're going to continue to focus to provide the best care for Alberta patients as we get through it. Thank you, Minister. We have time for just a few more questions. Operator, can you let through the next caller, please? Thank you, Joshua Hall, Red Deer News Now. Hi there. My questions are for the Minister today. Um, this past Sunday, as was just alluded to, uh, wait times at Red Deer Regional Hospital peaked at over 14 hours with an average wait time of nearly four hours over the weekend. Uh, local doctors and citizens have been sounding the alarm over this infrastructure deficit for years and long before COVID, while funding for hospital expansion has continued to be kicked down the road. With a business case that's under review, as we know, what commitment can you make, Minister, to Central Zone residents and doctors today that you're doing all you can to see that hospital expansion starts construction as soon as possible. Yeah, so we, we, we fully understand um, the need for increased infrastructure within the central zone uh, and, and Red Deer. And I, and I can't, uh, and work is being done on that, I can tell you. Uh, and I can't tell anything, uh, I can't tell you anything further. Um, you know, decisions will be made uh, over the coming weeks uh, in terms of what projects will, will go ahead in, uh, in the budget. Um, but this, I, I, we are aware that there's a there's there's an infrastructure deficit there, uh, and as you indicated, uh, work has been ongoing in terms of uh, how do we address that. Thank you, Minister. And do you have a follow up? I do. Thanks. Um, just to to go back to that same subject, uh, you know, one doctor told us today that uh, the pressure at the hospital in Red Deer is extreme. Another says the fact that expansion hasn't happened yet means ultimately that patients are receiving quote substandard care. So when you hear these types of accounts, Minister, what does that make you think about how several iterations of government have failed to provide the nearly half million Albertans in the central zone the level of health care that they deserve? Yeah. So our, our focus uh, of our government and AHS is, is provide, you know, equitable health care across the, the entire province. Um, we understand that there has been a, uh, uh, a, a, a request and, 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 quite frankly, a, a need for uh, infrastructure in, uh, in Red Deer. Um, you know, I've had a number of conversations like that. Uh, and again, work has been going uh, ongoing in that regard. And uh, we'll be able to say more, uh, yeah, hopefully, in, uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you very much, Minister. Operator, can you let our next caller, please? Shane Clausing, Everything GP. Good afternoon. This question is for uh, Minister Coffing. Uh, we've received some uh, messages this week from people in the Peace Region saying, uh, I guess they've gone to an emergency room and uh, were unable to get the care in Grand Prairie, so they were potentially uh, taken to uh, Edmonton on a medivac, including one woman who took her child there, and uh, they said they couldn't help her. Uh, obviously, this is a brand new hospital. Uh, what is the current situation at the uh, Grand Prairie Regional Hospital here in Grand Prairie, and uh, are you guys concerned about uh, hearing a story like that? Yeah, so every time I hear a story that raises a concern, this is the first story that I've heard that there was concerns in the ability of the new hospitals to provide uh, to provide care. So happy to look into that uh, look into that further. Thank you. Do you have a follow up? Yeah, I'm just wondering too. Uh, just obviously, the, the new hospital now here is built and up and running. Uh, given uh, September saw a pretty. Uh, Pretty tough, uh, or I guess a grim look here for the Grand Prairie region, just in terms of how COVID-19 was hitting the uh, QE2 hospital. Obviously, that's now gone. So just wondering, how is the Grand Prairie Regional Hospital this time around coping with uh, the amount of COVID-19 patients? Yeah, my, my and I, I don't have the exact data, and, and staff can follow up with you on that. My understanding is that the... Uh, um, when, when we take a look at uh, across the province, uh, the sites that are the most impacted uh, are primarily in Calgary, uh, Edmonton, and, uh, and you actually see some of that in, in Red Deer as well. Uh, in Grand Prairie, my understanding is it's, that's not as impacted, but uh, I'll let staff follow up in terms of the, the exact percentage of capacity on our emergency departments there. 
Thank you very much, Minister. We have time for one more question. Operator, can you let through our final caller, please? Andrea Williams, CBC. Hi, my question is for Minister Copping. I don't know if that was mentioned in the press conference, so I, I apologize if uh, you said it already. But I wanted to know how much of the how much boxes or pills of Paxlovid have we received so far, and what's the plan uh, to um, receive more? Yeah, there are three thousand two hundred uh, courses of treatment uh, we have received. Uh, been in conversations with my colleagues across the government, across the country, and the and the federal government. Um, we've received them already. There's a plan to to receive more in February. We don't have the exact numbers or the exact date yet, uh, but we're pressing the federal government to, to be, provide uh, more courses of treatment uh, because we believe that this can be a uh, another tool in the toolkit uh, to reduce the impact on our hospitals and and the impact on Albertans. Thank you, Minister and Andrian. Do you have a follow-up question? Uh, no, all the questions have been asked. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our callers today and to Minister Copping and Dr. Hinshaw. Thank you.